Any questions before I start? Questions? OK, so I have uh, today some review problems on Faraday's law. Two of them, I have uh, put them on the board. Uh, so I will start with the, the first example, uh, which is a frame that is rotating uh, uh, around the Z axis. And you see that I have uh, a resistance of 10 ohms in the frame. The frame rotates with 10 radians per second. And it is within a magnetic field, a constant magnetic field of 0.2 Tesla that is in the Y direction. So the magnetic field is this way. Imagine there is a magnet that creates this magnetic field. And uh, the frame is spinning like this around the z axis at 10 radians per second. And we're being asked to find the voltage across the resistor, uh, the way that it has been uh, defined. So this is um, a Faraday law problem. And obviously, this uh, voltage is being created through the electromotive force due to the changing magnetic flux through the circuit. And you remember that we have two methods to calculate such problems. Uh, the first method, so first of all, we need to apply Faraday's law. There is two ways to apply Faraday's law here. You see, this is, uh, is this a transformer or motional EMF? Uh, it's motional. It is motional because the magnetic field is constant, in fact. So we have a motional EMF. There are two ways to solve uh, such problems. I will present both of them for completeness, although I do prefer the first one, and I think the first one is easier to apply. So uh, first method. Uh, we find the total flux through the loop. Of course, as a function of time, uh, if we look at the loop on the uh, xy plane, and maybe I will just uh, redraw here the diagram. So you see, this is the lower part. Uh, the resistance is here. And then the upper part is parallel to that. And then we have the Z directed. And there is this spinning motion. So that means that the loop is moving on the X, parallel to the XY plane. So this is the XY plane. Uh, if I see it from the top, so imagine that you are seeing it from the top, then you see the x-axis coming down, the y-axis this way, uh, and uh, the z-axis coming uh, towards you. What would you see? You would see this segment of the circuit just moving this way. Okay. And then the magnetic flux going along the y axis. So uh, magnetic flux is the flux of the magnetic flux density through the loop. And that ds is the differential area vector that is always pointing perpendicular to the circuit, perpendicular to the loop. The trace of the loop on the xy plane is this line. So this is the easiest way to uh, realize that this normal vector to the loop points this way. And in fact, what I do here is I apply Faraday's law and uh, 
I should have said this uh, in the beginning. So now that I have uh, defined this ds for the loop, that, that ds points this way, as you see, in the loop. Uh, when I apply Faraday's law, I would trace the loop in the clockwise sense, in the clockwise direction. So if indeed I trace the loop in the clockwise direction, then the normal, the, the ds vector will be pointing inwards and will be pointing in the direction of the phi hat unit vector. So this n hat here is the phi hat unit vector, which I can express directly in Cartesian coordinates, and that is in Cartesian coordinates minus x hat sine phi plus y hat cosine phi. And you see that obviously this angle phi is changing with time because of the motion. So now I can calculate the total flux through the loop. Uh, the magnetic field, as you see, is constant. It's point to y. The n hat is minus x hat sine phi plus y cosine phi and ds i don't uh, that ds uh, if you uh, refer again to your age sheet whenever you have differential surface area element in cylindrical coordinates the phi hat area element is actually uh, dr da dz So I put it there, as you will see, we won't need it, but just for completeness, that would be the expression of this ds in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so now you see that uh, the uh, circuit, as it rotates, it intercepts only part of the flux. Obviously, when it is, uh, when the frame is on the x-axis, the magnetic field goes in the y-axis. Then this is the optimal orientation where it uh, intercepts uh, maximum amount of flux. Then when it comes along the y-axis, it intercepts no flux because the magnetic field just passes by uh, the frame without cutting the frame. So this is actually captured by the, uh, the inner product. And you will see that y dot x is 0, y dot y is 1. So we get 0.2 uh, cosine phi ds. Along the loop, the loop is a rectangular frame, 3 by 4 uh, centimeters, centimeter by centimeter. So The integration is fairly simple. You have uh, basically to find the area of this rectangular loop. And we have uh, 0.2 times uh, 12 times 10 to minus 4 cosine phi. So this is our flux. And uh, if we want to do a little bit uh, more algebra here, cosine phi. And uh, we've been told that this uh, is spinning with uh, uh, omega equal to 10 uh, radians per second. So that means that phi is this omega t, 10 times t. In fact, for, for completeness, the problem also says that at t equals 0, this angle is 0. So uh, that's why I don't have a constant here. So phi is equal to omega t, uh, 10 times t. Okay. So now that I have the flux, I can take the derivative of the flux with respect to time. And that will be d phi by dt equals to 
2.4 times 10 to minus 4 d by dt of the cosine phi I put in the expression for the angle and then uh, that gives me cosine of 10 t is the derivative minus 10 sine of 10 t. So that uh, makes it 2.4 times 10 to minus 3 sine of 10 t. So I'm getting this time rate of change of the magnetic flux. And that means that the EMF, Faraday's law says it will be minus that. So I had the minus sign here. So minus minus gives me plus. So I have 2.4 sine of 10 T millivolts that is being induced uh, in the uh, in the circuit. So that is the EMF. So now what did we do and what did we find? We applied uh, we applied uh, Faraday's law on this circuit and uh, we took DS inwards we traced the loop that means in the clockwise direction, like that. And that means that the EMF that we calculated acts as a virtual source that if it were positive, it would drive a current in the direction that we are tracing the loop. So I will put it in, I will put this virtual source in here. So this is the EMF that I calculated. And this is the voltage that I'm asked to determine. So if I apply uh, here Kirchhoff's voltage law, you see that minus V minus the EMF is equal to zero. That means that V is equal to minus this EMF. So after all, there is a minus sign in front of the in front of the voltage. Okay, so you see that the uh, signs will sort themselves out. Yes, please. Uh, I have a question in terms of like, where is phi uh, zero degree? Is it at x axis? Sorry? Where is phi equals to zero degree? Is it on the x axis? That's a good question. Where is phi equal to zero degrees? It is the x axis. That is cylindrical coordinate systems. If we don't remember what the coordinates are, <laughs> that's a non-starter. So it is phi is uh, phi is defined like this. You have the x and the y direction. If you have a point here in the Cartesian coordinate system, the coordinates are x and y. And in cylindrical coordinates, this is r and this is phi. And phi goes between 0 and 2 pi. So it measures angle from the positive, z, uh, positive x axis and r measures distance from the z axis. So r is square root of x squared plus y squared. Phi is inverse tangent of y over x. Okay. Any other questions? So this is the first method. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, in motional EMF, right, you gave us two methods. The yes. One is this one, another one was U, U into a deal now. Right, I will do the second one now. Yeah. Uh, my question is, is does the, the method one, is, is it applicable for all kinds of motional EMF? Yeah, no. all of them, both of them are applicable to all kinds. In fact, this one, is the general method. You can apply it in motional or transformer or combined. Because here I applied Faraday's law in its most general form. And therefore, there is no limitation in this uh, form of the law. Uh, like if any question gives us the velocity, let's say. Mm. Uh, 
So how can we convert that to this equation? I mean, here you have angular velocity. I will do a second, uh, I, I will do a problem with velocity, don't worry. Yeah. But in this case, you, you will have to find uh, how the, um, how the area that intercepts flux change. Here as well, the area that intercepts flux change. The velocity exists, as I will show here, and it is an angular velocity. So you see that, uh, uh, again, if it is along the, the, the um, uh, magnetic field points in the y direction, and the loop is spinning along the z-axis. So when, it is, when the loop is along the x-axis, it intercepts maximal flux. That's why um, that's why we have here, you see flux 0.2y dot y cosine phi. So when phi is zero, you have maximum flux intercepted. Where is the flux? Its flux is, is right here. So you see at phi equals zero, when the loop is on the x-axis, the flux that is intercepted is maximum. Then when the loop goes to the y-axis, phi is 90 degrees and there is no flux intercepted, right? Because uh, then the flux runs parallel to the frame and there is no uh, flux that is intercepted there. So here, the area that intercepts changes. The total flux changes as a function of time, not because the magnetic field changes, but because the, uh, the loop spins. Yes? Does it matter like, where you put the v, EMF on the loop as long as the orientation is like the same? That's the great question. I'll come back to that question uh, with a specific example. It doesn't matter, no. And it doesn't matter because it's a virtual source. So because it's a virtual source, it means that there is an EMF along the loop. No matter where you put it, if you put it on the upper branch or the lower branch, it really doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so then I go to the second method. Uh, so the second method is based upon the formula that the EMF can be calculated as this transformer EMF part plus the emotional EMF part V cross B DL. So this is a transformer EMF, which we don't have here. So it is zero in this example. And then we have the motional EMF, which is this second term. So, uh, the, so this uh, formula basically tells you that you got to go along the circuit, find the velocity of each part of the circuit, and then take the cross product between that velocity and the magnetic field. So let's see how that uh, works out here. Again, I'm going to trace the loop in exactly the same way. So let me uh, call the uh, different segments of the loop. One, two, two, three, three, four, and four, one. And I will do this calculation separately so that uh, it is clear to you what, what happens. Uh, first of all, let's go to segment one, two. On segment one, two, segment one, two is on the axis. So therefore, it, it has no velocity. It is the one that everything else spins around it, but that one does not move. So there is no motional EMF there as a result. V is equal to zero. I go now to section two, three. 
And in fact, I will do it, um, well, I will do it separately. Uh, two, three, the velocity of 2, 3 is the same as the velocity of 1, 4, as you see here. So if we see 2, 3 from the top, from the xy plane, this is what we see. Okay. So here we have velocity because of circular motion. That, is, that velocity is for every point here. Let's say if you take a point uh, of distance r from the axis, its velocity is in the direction of the circular motion, which is the phi direction as we discussed before. And the magnitude is omega times the distance from the axis of the rotation. That is omega r. So this is omega r. So I will use the expression for the uh, phi unit vector that I had given before, minus x hat sine phi plus y cosine phi omega r. And now I uh, take one more step, find v cross b. So v is omega r minus x hat sine phi plus y cosine phi. And b is this y point 2. Let me just uh, put b naught for now, and then I will replace the numbers at the end. That is a bit more convenient. So let me call it B naught. I'll put the numbers at the end if needed. You will see that here they are not needed. So I have to run a cross product. X cross Y is Z. First of all, I collect all the constants, omega R, B naught. X cross Y is Z with uh, a minus in a, is minus z hat sine phi. And then I have y cross y, which is 0. Remember, the cross product between a unit vector and itself is 0. So then this v cross b is minus z hat omega r b naught sine phi. Now, you see the emotional EMF term actually requires that I put in also dl. And I take the dot product of this with dl. So here I am, and I'm tracing the loop. And this is uh, the part where I trace. I go from point 0.2 to point 0.3. Anybody can see what will be the corresponding dl here. So I'm moving away from the z-axis parallel to the xy plane. What would be dl? dl. So I'm moving away from the z-axis parallel to the xy plane. What is the corresponding dl? dr. It's dr. Cannot be d phi because I would be moving along the angular direction. Cannot be dz because that, that means that I would change my height. So the only option is really dr. So it is dr r hat. So all in all, if I take v cross b dot dl, that will give me and z dot r is equal to 0, because these are orthogonal unit vectors in the uh, cylindrical coordinate system. So therefore, v cross b dot l here is 0. And there is no motional EMF either on this segment. Physically, why there is no motional EMF? There is no motional EMF because if you look at the motion of the loop, uh, the wire moves in the angular direction. So it moves like this. And then there is this magnetic field that goes in the y direction. So 
the magnetic force, the force from the ma magnetic field points downwards. So the force that the electrons inside this part of the wire will feel will actually be pointing downwards. And that force cannot actually produce any voltage across the ends of the wire. That's physically why. So I run the integral here, I, I run the operations here to convince you that the emotional EMF here is zero. However, one could have guessed it right away from the physics of the problem. Uh, you can, if uh, this uh, uh, direction of the loop uh, is confusing you, in fact, you can see it here from V cross B. V cross B is always pointing in the direction of the force of the magnetic force. So you see V cross B here ends up being in the minus Z hat direction. And this force, this is basically parallel to the force that is applied to the charges inside the wire. So such a force cannot actually produce a voltage across the wire. Uh, produce a strain on the wire, but it does not produce any voltage because for voltage you need to move the charges uh, across the terminals. sorry, uh, along the wire so that uh, they produce uh, different potential uh, at the two terminals. So uh, here you have zero. You can easily show that you can repeat the same process and also by the same argument for one will also be zero. So let me just put it here that from four to one, by a similar process, you can show it is zero. So the only place actually where you can see an EMF is 3-4, is the branch 3-4. And 3-4, again, instead of uh, putting in numbers, for now, let me just put symbols W and H. You see that uh, 3, 4, all the points are at the same distance from the z-axis. So in fact, if you look from the top, 3, 4 looks like a point. Imagine that you, that you see the uh, frame spinning from the top. 3, 4 as a segment would actually look to you as a point. You could if you look at from the top, you only can see point three that is moving on a circle. Of what radius? Radius equal to the width of the frame. So then for all these points, the velocity is omega times w, the width of the frame, in the phi direction. And now uh, the V cross B will be omega W. Uh, this uh, phi hat again is minus x sine phi plus y cosine phi. You see that the result will come out very similar to the one that we had before. Y B naught. So we have now omega W, the width, B naught minus x dot y gives you minus z hat b naught. Okay. And now what is dl? So I'm moving along the z axis here. So what will be dl in this case? Uh, it's going up, right? So it's z exit. It is dz z hat. So I don't care if it goes up and down, that, because dz is an algebraic quantity, so that will sort itself out in the integration. But I'm moving along the z axis. So now the dl that I have is dz z hat. And all in all, v cross b dot dl will be omega w, uh, sorry, put 
B not twice. So, uh, omega W B not minus Z dot Z hat DZ. So this is my V cross B DL here. Minus Z dot Z gives me still a, a minus one. B not DZ. And now I will put in the numbers. Omega is this minus 10 radius radians per second. Uh, w is the, uh, the width that uh, we had three centimeters. B not is the magnetic field, is this uh, point 0.2 Tesla DZ. So I think it's minus 0 0.06 DZ. So this is the V cross BDL. So now I put everything together. Uh, I have uh, the V cross BDL for all four segments. And uh, as you see, I have no transformer EMF, just the motional. So then the only part, the only integral I have is the one that goes from 3 to 4 minus 0 0.06 dz. And uh, as I integrate from 3 to 4 with respect to dz, at 3, z is equal to the height of the uh, loop, which is 4 centimeters. And at 4, the height is 0. So I'm going downwards. So that's why I'm saying that many people would put here minus dz z hat. This is wrong, because dz itself is an algebraic quantity. So the, you, the, the, uh, the, the DL here is dz z hat just as shown in your H sheet. You don't have to worry about the sign. The sign will sort itself out. dz is not uh, necessarily positive. So as you see here, when you go from a high z to a low z, dz will necessarily be negative, And therefore, the, uh, the result will be uh, correct. So overall, I have minus 0 0.06 times 0 minus 0 0.04. And I find, again, this uh, plus uh, plus uh, 2.4. I think I sign phi is missing, right? Uh, so I think it's missing here. So x cross y, a sign phi is here, and it should be here, and it should be here. Sorry about that. And it should be here, and it should be here. And then it should be also here, uh, not here, but here. Sine phi, and then here I have also sine phi. Sorry about that. So it doesn't really affect much. And we have finally the 2.4 times 10 to minus 3 sine phi. Phi is omega t, so we have this 2.4 sine 10t millivolts again as the EMF. So the, uh, the, the, the procedure may seem a bit longer. Because I pretended I hadn't realized that there would be an EMF only in one segment. Of course, with solving examples and so on, you can realize that actually here, the only segment where you would apply this formula would be this one. And then you would actually be able to solve this much faster. Uh, but this is how it works out. You need to find the V, you need to find the DL, and then run the cross product. If you actually have 
an insight about how this works, then the solution would not be much longer than the previous one. Still, I do think that the previous one is a bit clearer for you to understand and apply. Yes. In terms of knowing the direction of uh, B, like velocity and also the magnetic field direction, uh, how, how do we associate, like, you know, you said uh, by intuition from, like, by practice, we should know that which one actually gives you zero. Uh, contribution which one doesn't. So how can we ha have an idea by just by seeing the figure itself? So the the figure here shows you that the loop is spinning in the angular direction. Okay. So for example, take the loop in uh, in this direction here, right? when it crosses the y-axis, the magnetic field is like this. Okay. So this part of the loop moves inwards, right? The loop is spinning. So therefore, the velocity here is inwards. And we know that, that uh, magnetic force is proportional to V cross B. So for the upper segment, you see V goes inwards, B goes to the right, and then the force is pointing this way. That force cannot produce a voltage, because to produce a voltage across these terminals, you need to move the electrons this way, along the wire. When it's moving this way. It's moving that way, yes. So that force can produce a strain on the wire, but cannot produce a voltage. Okay. So now, if you repeat this on this segment, you see that the force still points downwards, but now that force can produce a voltage because the wire points the direction of the force. So in other words, to get voltage, you need to have your wire along the direction of the force. If it's not along the direction of the force, then, then there won't be any uh, voltage. Any other questions? OK, so let me quickly go to the uh, second example. So that second example is a moving square loop. And uh, that moves within a magnetic field that is being created by a current. So that magnetic field. is in fact circulating around the current like this. So the magnetic flux density will be mu naught i of t by 2 pi r phi hat. So this is one of the first cases that we had seen for a magnetic field. Now the uh, of a straight wire, we had solved it with the Biot-Savart law and with the Ampere law. And now the only thing that changes is that I'm putting in a loop that is moving in this magnetic field. And it's starting from distance are not, it is a square loop, so D is the side. Uh, and uh, we have two resistors, the 5 ohm and the uh, 10 ohm, and we are being asked to find V1 and V2. Okay, we are being asked to find those two voltages. So again, I will apply Faraday's law on the loop. So my uh, Faraday contour is this one, is the loop itself. Uh, I can trace it either in the clockwise or a counterclockwise direction. Let me just trace it in the uh, clockwise direction like this. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> that means my ds will be pointing inwards and this inward direction is actually the phi direction phi dr dz so then the time varying magnetic flux will be uh, the integral magnetic field flux density mu naught i by 2 pi r phi hat dr dz phi dot phi is equal to 1 mu naught i by 2 pi are constants so I take them out and then I have an integration of dr over r you see that uh, the distance of the loop from uh, the z-axis starts at r sub naught and goes to r sub naught plus d so the limits here are between r naught and r naught plus d and the uh, dz is from 0 to uh, D. So let's uh, say that uh, on this side you have z equals 0 and then here z equals D. This is a square loop anyway. So finally I get mu naught by 2 pi. This integral will give me D, the side of the loop, and this integral will give me a logarithm R0 plus D by R0. And all this is multiplied by the only time varying term, which is I of T. Okay. So now I can uh, find, uh, so now I have the flux. I can find uh, the time rate of change of that flux, d phi over dt which is proportional to the rate of change of the current. di over dt. Um, the current is given to vary sinusoidally with time. So it's i naught cosine omega t and therefore this will be minus omega mu naught d over 2 pi i naught sine omega t so this will be the this will be the uh, minus uh, the rate of change of this uh, flux so that means that i have an emf let me redraw the loop here. Again, I'm applying Faraday's law, uh, tracing the loop in the clockwise direction. This way. That means my ds points inwards. And that also means that what, what I'm about to calculate will be a virtual source, I, will, I keep repeating it, a virtual source that I can insert in the circuit so that if it was positive, it would drive a current in the direction I'm tracing the loop. So this is the EMF that I'm about to calculate. Remember, the problem calls for these two voltages, V1 and V2, which, this is the important part about Faraday's law, won't be the same anymore. And these resistors are not in parallel anymore as long as you have now an electromotive force uh, because of the time varying magnetic flux. So this EMF will be minus that d phi over dt. And that means it is actually plus omega mu naught d over 2 pi. So this is a symbolic problem and I don't have uh, numbers, but this will be the EMF. Uh, and then uh, to find uh, V1 and V2, 
what can we do next? Any ideas? We can do a KVM. Right, so, well, the easiest way for me is to find the total current, I. And then simply say that, uh, the, that V2 will be, you see the way the current flows, it enters the terminal from V2 from the positive to the negative terminal, so therefore V2 will be plus this current times R2. So this is the little danger in the voltage division, whereas V1 will be actually minus this current times R1, so minus VEMF R1 by R1 plus R2. So that will be the... Um, this, will, this will be the two voltages. Okay, so you see that uh, we got this uh, result uh, that uh, the current is obviously uh, varying uh, sinusoidally uh, all the time. You can uh, look at many different time snapshots and realize that the direction of the current will be consistent with what we call Lenz's law. Uh, but uh, the point is that one can just apply Faraday's law and you can find uh, your result. So any questions on this? Yes. So at the start, right, you wrote C trace clockwise direction, and you said that the S is going inside the plane. That's right. Uh, so did you just assume that, or? No, I didn't assume that. This is very important, again, from Faraday's law. You can trace the loop clockwise or counterclockwise. But once you settle, then DS is found through this right-hand rule. So if I had traced it counterclockwise, my DS would be pointing outwards because that's how the right-hand rule works. If I had, now that I trace it clockwise, DS points inwards. So, so you are uh, free to choose the direction you trace the loop. Once you trace the loop, then DS has to be consistent with the right-hand rule. Oh, so Tracing is a buyout choice, but whatever the DS will show is something based on how we did the tracing. That's right. Okay. Um, so, as uh, you remember, always the direction of the current opposes the change in the magnetic flux, the change in the magnetic flux. So, I have here a small demonstration uh, where uh, I have two cylinders. One is made of magnetic uh, material, so it is a magnet, and one is made of aluminum. And I have here, a, I have two cylinders. This is a copper cylinder. And uh, if I throw the aluminum, uh, the aluminum uh, block, that goes through very quickly. As you see, there is no. Now I will repeat this with a magnet. So we see an effect that is very similar to the magnetic brakes. Any idea what slows down this magnet as it goes through copper? Yes. So when the magnet goes through the copper, because it's a conducting material, it tries to attract one another because uh, the magnetic... The, no, that's not it. That's not it. And in fact, I will uh, repudiate your argument by using this cylinder, which is also made of copper, but the only uh, difference is it has a slot. Okay? So you will see that it goes through as if the cylinder is in there, just like the aluminum uh, block. Um, and therefore, what you're saying is not can be true. So it is going through fairly quickly. Is it so I think she has an idea. Go ahead. Is it Lenz's law because uh, the force is in the opposite direction to the other? Yes. So it is a combination of Lenz's law and current forces. So the magnetic block 
let's say that uh, it has north and south here. As it drops through the cylinder, or let's put the north here and the south here so that we have the magnetic flux lines going through, it tries to drive magnetic flux through the copper cylinder. Okay? So therefore, by Faraday's law, there will be an electromotive force on copper and hence eddy currents on copper. So there will be currents here. Which way will the currents flow? By Lenz's law, they will try to resist the increasing magnetic flux. So they will be flowing this way. So therefore, these currents now will produce their own magnetic field that is like this. So the copper is magnetized. This magnetic field corresponds to a magnet that has its north pole here and the south pole underneath. And therefore, you have a situation where you have a magnet that comes with a north pole and faces another magnet with again the north pole. So those two repel each other and hence we have the breaking effect that you just uh, saw. And you can repeat the same exercise when the, the principle is basically the same like the pendulum that I demonstrated last week. You can repeat the same exercise as the magnet leaves now. And now the eddy currents are introduced in such a way that they reinforce the magnetic flux that now as this magnet leaves tends to reduce. So in this case now the the magnet has this flux and then the eddy currents on the copper will try to reinforce that magnetic field that is now leaving and they will be flowing now in the opposite direction like this and again they will have a breaking effect. So I will stop here if you have any questions I'll stick around and otherwise I will continue on Wednesday with more review problems.